Hey guys, welcome to the shop. This week I've got a mixed video for you. We're going to be doing a little bit of machine work, some lathe work, some mill work. I've got a couple parts that I need to make. They're both identical, so I'll show you me making one of those. I've also got some maintenance that I got to do to my air compressor and my wife's 1986 C30 crew cab dually that she named Johnny Cash. I've got some quick stuff that I got to do to it as well. I also want to show you what has changed with this pickup truck for those that are interested. I've uh, made some progress lately. Some parts and stuff have been added that I think are nice. I've also got a dumpster find that I want to share with you as well. Now, I don't know if this thing works or not. I pulled it out of the dumpster. I haven't even tested it yet. But if it does work, I think it's an awesome find. So we'll do that as well. So thank you for watching and uh, let's get started. I get excited about dumpster stuff. So here is a quick look at the part that I got to make. I got to make two of these. They're going on a tire changer. This little section here is a half 13 threaded section that's an inch and a half long or about 38 mil for the metric guys. That immediately goes into a 45 degree taper that transfers into the body here that is going to be on the end a 13 16 hex or around 20 mil. So the body needs to be about two and a quarter inches long or around 57 millimeter. So I was given some freedom with this. I could hex the whole thing if I wanted to, but just for speed, I'm just gonna do the end so you can get a socket on that. And uh, an inch and a half maximum length on the threaded section. So nothing super critical here, other than needs to fit on a 13 16 socket, and the thread needs to go in a half 13 hole, and it needs to be really close to this length. So that's it, should be pretty simple. We are gonna be making it out of a piece of grade eight bolt. This is just a large grade eight bolt that I got. So we'll make it out of that, should be plenty sufficient. So let's go over to the lathe. We'll blast out the body and the thread, and then we'll take it to the mill and uh, do our hex work in a 5C collet block. So we're gonna start off at the saw here. So the overall length of this part, and we'll be able to hold this in all of our equipment, or all of our tooling if we just cut this to the length that it needs to be basically right off the get-go there's no reason to have a bunch of extra stock so three and three quarter inches i'm just going to cut that slightly below four and then we will go over the lathe and get started cutting this out So I've got the stock and the chuck the lathe here. We're gonna be working the back section first that we're gonna be turning into the hex. I need to turn this section down to the major distance across the points of this hex, which is 13 sixteenths. So that's 925 thousandths is what we need to go down to. We are currently at 100 or one inch and yeah, one inch and 45 thousandths. So I'm just going to come in and face it, and then we'll start working down to our 925 thousandths. Sacks, pull off 30.
one more light cut. 925 is what we're after. We're at 933, so we need eight thousandths. So the finish of this doesn't matter. We're going to be, we'll clean it up. We hit it within a half that. 924. It's good enough. So now we can flip it and work our threaded section. So about an inch and a half for our threaded section. So this has got to be our major diameter for our half 13 thread, which will be half inch, right below that few thou. Seems to work good. So now that our major thread damper is done, I'm going to just come in, put a slight taper on the end of that, so our thread will start easy and it'll look it'll look finished. So now we're going to set up for threading. So half 13 or 13 threads per inch. There we go. Two. And there. Yep. We're good. Slow the lathe down. And turn on the lead screw. So this is a relatively long thread with, I mean, I could put a center on it, but I don't think it'll be needed. I'm going to be feeding in, it's about 29 and a half degrees, 60 degree on my, on the dial here. That way we'll pretty much just be cutting on the very point and the leading edge of this threading tool. And it's just a carbide insert. I do need to make sure that my tool is square with the work. Just got my fishtail gauge here, bringing in that threading tool. I didn't want to feed straight in. It puts a lot of pressure on the part. We'll get a lot of push, we'll probably get a lot of push off. So, that actually looks pretty good. So what I'm going to do is come in, touch off, zero, zero, and then this will just be used to back, the, or the cross slide will just be used to give me clearance, back up, and then I'll only be feeding in with the compound. Zero on our compound, we'll come in and touch off, get our cross slide. There we go. 
go. And I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna make a scratch pass. Just quickly check my thread, even though we're set up for half 13, just for good practice. And then come in, start making passes, cut this thread. So this is a little bear cut C Molly D is the is the lubricant. It's really great for stainless thread cutting stuff like that. Screws on. One more. going to get. That's as good as I'm going to get it anyway. So now that the thread's cut, I'm going to do my 45 here. Then we'll go over to the, I'll flip it, face the other end, and we'll go to the milling machine and put our hex in it. the taper just back and forth with the compound making sure to undercut this section here at the end of the thread that way this part can thread all the way up on if it needs to it's cut to, uh, down below the root so this should continue on until it hits that taper and it does so that's well, good enough now I'm going to knock that burr off there and then we'll go over to the to the mill and do our hex. So I'm over here in the do-all milling machine getting set up to put our hex on there. Got a six-sided 5C block with a 15 16th 5C collet. So that'll go in the vise like that. Simplest way to index that I know. And I'm locating this collet block in the vise. That way I can flip it and get it back into the same depth using a little vise stop here. This is shop made by Roy Grimes, a gentleman that passed away quite some time ago and I bought a large toolbox of his. He was a tool and die maker 
and I bought a bunch of his tools. And this is just one of them, uh, the lot that I bought. And, and I use them all the time. So I was going to make one of these years ago, but once I got this one, I didn't need to. And I've been using old Roy's vice stop ever since. So, you know, be a great little shop project. Super simple. Super simple thing to make. So the way that I do it is I touch off, I feed in a little bit, I make a pass, flip 180 degrees, make another pass, and then measure you know, across the, across the flats. So I'm at 8.55, I want to be at 8.05, so I'm 50 thousandths off. So I know that I need to either feed the quill down 25 thousandths or the table up 25 thousandths, and I should be able to hit my number of 805 thousandths across the flats. Is done other than I'm going to stick it back in the lathe and I remove that sharp edge so anything you put on there socket or whatever four-way just slides up on instead of having a real sharp edge there so let's do that super quick and then this part will be done and my eyelids are sweating it's so hot out here <laughs> So I'm bad about haunting dumpsters. Yeah, I'll take a look in one if I walk past it. And the other day I walked past a dumpster and this was in that dumpster. Exactly the way you see it right here, spider webs and all. It is a, it's a Dayton speed controller with a DC one horsepower electric motor. It's 180 volt DC, it says armature voltage, then uh, Armature current is 5.3 amps. It does not have a plug on it. 
So I'm going to stick a plug on this thing. I'm so interested to see if this works. I'd be surprised if it does, but I don't know. It looks like it's almost set around forever. You know, there's rust on the, on the shaft there and stuff. So it, this could have just been storage. I don't know. And somebody storage and they threw it out. I'm not for sure, but I've been looking for a motor with a speed controller, just something super cheap and simple to put on my big 48 inch fan that I use, that I blow air on myself outside when I'm working because it's a little anemic. I've got a, a large one and it's just a little weak. So I was looking for one that I could adjust the speed on. So when I'm filming, it kind of gets quiet, maybe turn it down a bit so it's quiet and then, uh, you know, gear it in a way so I could crank it up when I'm me and, when me and Cora are roasting outside working, ain't we? we need to get cooled off. So let's put a plug on this thing and see if it works. So not only does a fan blowing on you cool you off, it also keeps the mosquitoes from eating you because right now I'm getting to eat up with mosquitoes. But it won't be long. Fall is here and those mosquitoes will be last year news soon. So will the need for a fan. Get in there. I'm hoping that somebody just pulled the plug off this thing and, you know, chucked it in the trash, assumed it was junk, or maybe just didn't need it. And to them it was junk, I don't know. It kind of looks like junk. But if it works, I don't care what it looks like. So I haven't looked to see what an equivalent you know, one horsepower Dayton DC motor and drive would cost, but I can assure you they are probably not cheap. So, let me grab that cord. Let's see if this dude works. So before I try this, let's stick a piece of tape on here so you'll be able to see if it does does a thing or, or not. So that is off and that's so down. Uh, let's see what she does, if anything. On. Nothing. Oh, it does work. I guess you have to turn it on a certain amount. That is so... Oh, look, it's throwing out spiders and stuff. That's all the way up. 1720 RPM. But I bet it's got a ton of torque. Huh. Yeah, it doesn't take much to make me happy. That is so cool that that actually works. I don't know if it works like it should. Seems like 35% would be more than that, but whatever. It turns. So air compressors, the oil in them is just notorious, especially piston reciprocating compressors for getting really nasty. I've got some service. We're going to change the oil in this thing, basically. This is the second time that I've done it. The first time that I've done it, I was just shocked. The oil that came out of this thing literally looked like the consistency of jelly with spurts of water and stuff coming out of it. It was horribly thick and nasty. Now these don't get hot enough, or at least this one does not get hot enough to evaporate any water that gets in the oil out of it like you would on a, you know, a car engine or anything. They're compressing, in my case anyway, hot, humid, you know, moisture-filled air that just can condenses in the cylinders and gets down in the crankcase and you know you may check it and it looks full in fact it may be over full because it just keeps getting more water and water in it so it's important to change the oil uh, in your uh, in your air compressor they get bad and pretty quick so let's uh, fire this thing up I'm gonna let it get warmed up with the oil that's in it so it drains easy I'm gonna give it a little air leak let it get hot we'll drain it out and then we'll fill it back up and then I'll do it one more time in the future for long to try to get this thing internally anyway cleaned back up because it was bad. Oh sh So 
So I'm going to give this thing an air leak down here just so it doesn't fill up and it gets the compressor itself hot. Compressor like this one, it takes quite a quite a long time to get some heat in it, but that's pretty good. So we've got a compressor at work. It's about the size of a small car. It's a big uh, screw compressor, and you know, a totally different animal than this thing. Builds air just ridiculously fast. Looking like it's getting cleaner. I think that I'm gonna put a valve on this thing where I don't have to, you know, continuously, you know, use a wrench to change the oil. Yeah, the first time I changed oil on this, it, it literally just kind of clumped out. Looking a lot better. Yeah, that's not too bad. It's nothing like it was the first time. So with an air compressor like this, I'd rather use relatively affordable oil and just change it really often than you know drop a bunch of money on a real high-priced oil and then have to keep it in there a long time, as dirty as they get, as quickly as they get dirty anyway. Just my opinion. I think that's it. Yep, it's full. All right, oil changed. These are pretty simple. Change oil in. So I'm up here on the roof of the shop, which this time of year I have to do, it's starting to rain right now, I have to do at least once a week. My gutters get so clogged up because basically my shop is under a bunch of trees and to clean out my gutters, like a lot of people, I use a leaf blower. It works really well. So I've got what I hope will be a relatively quick job, even though what I'm about to do is not necessarily quick to do on this truck, and that is change this passenger side front brake rotor. Now I turned both of these brake rotors. They were really rusty and pitted because this truck had set for about 15 years. This is Johnny Cash, my wife's 1986 crew cab. I turned both of these rotors in the shop on my lathe. For the most part, that was a successful job, although they're really hard to hold in the size of the machine that I got due to the design of these things. The one that is on this truck on the passenger side right now is below the minimum legal thickness that you're supposed to be able to turn them, and this one did not turn out as nice as the other one. It's got a little shimmy in it. I didn't get to show that on camera. It was not a successful job, although I could indicate this on its bearings, mark it, take it off, put it back into the lathe and get it back straight, I opted, because it's thinner than it should be, to just change it all together with a, with a new one. So let's pull off this big, heavy wheel, and uh, you know, I'll show you the design of this rotor and you know, what makes it difficult, and we'll change it out. 
and hopefully get rid of my little breaking chamois. So it's amazing how many folks in the comments previously when I showed these wheels on the channel lost their minds <laughs> because of these paper thin, not literally paper thin, but super thin plastic spikes that tall grass would knock off. I uh, had one comment say, I thought you loved animals, like I was going to drive through the dog park, you know, with these, purposefully trying to <laughs> disembowel the critters. Uh, you know, people that see stuff like this, they think they think it's solid steel and heavy, not realizing that they're just paper-thin plastic. You know, these may not be your style, these spikes. They are a bit flashy, but to be honest, they're not mine either. They were actually ordered by accident. I wanted the acorn style, and me being the procrastinator that I am, hello Lulu, I waited too long to return them and just figured I'd lose a couple and then we'd get the ones that I really wanted, or that Elizabeth really wanted, to start with. She's not crazy, crazy about these either, but she's also not crazy about spending <laughs> the extra money to buy different ones just because, you know, they're not her favorites. All right, let's pull off. This big wheel. So because these are actually uh, semi-truck wheels, tractor trailer wheels, they have to have a large adapter to bolt to this truck. You'll see it when I get the wheel. Nothing light about these wheels. So see how this big adapter plate actually bolts to the hub? That's what enables you to run such a large wheel on a truck that really wasn't designed for it. adapter. Big old heavy chunk of steel in itself. So you can hear, hopefully, that that's got rubs and lets off, rubs and lets off. Listen. It's just not as true as it could be. On these there's a little access hole because you can't get this dust cover off unless you can get to the back side of it to kind of knock it loose so you got to go through that hole get that off that way we gotta pull our brake rotor off so some of these uh, trucks like this, same year I think, even had bolt-on calipers or the type that wedge on, like this one. Now this has just got a, a clip with a spring in it that slides and holds tension against the against the brake caliper and uh, holds it on. Slider and a uh, and a spring there holds it on. Mosquitoes are eating me up. I am not changing brake shoes on this thing because I mean there is nothing wrong with these. Really thick. Perfectly smooth on both sides, so we'll be reusing those. Ooh. 
Oh, in the center. Oh, I still throw that in the rocks because that's a good place for it. And pull off the caliper or rotor. So what makes these difficult, or a little more difficult than some others, is that it's all one piece. You can see you got your lug studs, it's your hub, it's your rotor, you got your wheel seal, all in one unit. Not all that strange, but you know, it just makes it more difficult than some of these modern, smaller, lighter vehicles who, who uh, you know, have just an independent brake rotor instead of you know, it all being one unit. So we've got to put a new wheel seal in. There's our rear bearing. I'm not going to repack these bearings. Just going to pack, clean out the new rotor, pack the hub with grease, boom, put it in. In fact, uh, these, the rotor that I bought, come with the uh, bearing races already in it. And I'm assuming because it's uh, when they surface, the brake surface here, it's indicated off of the bearing races that are pre-installed in these to make sure that they get them as straight as possible. That's my assumption. I'm not a brake guy, but that's what I would guess is the reason why they come with the races pre-installed is because they're ground on those races. It's really nice that these come with studs. I mean, studs and, like I said, bearing races. So the reason that I'm not cleaning and repacking these bearings is because I just done this not too long ago. So they, don't, they just don't need it. I am gonna put fresh grease in the hub, but that's it. That's all they need. New wheel seal. So in the case of wheel bearings and electric motors and stuff, it's really easy to overdo it on the grease. More grease does not, does not equal more better. As long as you got enough to where when the bearing heats up, the grease kind of melts down and gets in the bearing, that's good enough. Too much grease can't, if it's completely full of grease, it can't get out of the way of the rolling bearings. Those bearings continuously churn that grease, create a ton of extra heat, can cause seal failure, bearing failure. You know, sometimes it takes a lot less than what you would think uh, you know, it would be optimum. So don't pack your hubs and stuff completely full of grease. Leave some space in there for that grease to move out of the way of those bearings. And when everything heats up, you know, that grease will flow down and get in the bearings. Same way with electric motors. You know, they don't require as much as what a lot of people think. Oh, my daylight is fading. washer and where there's my castle nut put a new carter pin in it and that is one changed hub so something that people they tend to have problems with is how tight to tighten up the wheel bearings what i do especially on like a new set like this not new bearings but it's a new setup is I'll tighten it down pretty tight. That's tighter than what I would want to run these. You can see it stops pretty quick. Tighten it down. I know everything should be seated in there. 
and I back up a little bit till I feel it pressure on this nut start to really let off. And before it lets off completely, like that's nothing, right in that area there, right about, you know, right about there, just good and snug, that's pretty good. And it will loosen up a little bit as all the grease and stuff moves out of the way. But that's what I do when I carry an infrared temp gun with me. And I'll just kind of monitor it for the first few miles. First few miles I'll stop, check it, and see if it's not getting excessively hot. And if it's not, then I'll leave it alone. Because, uh, you know, I've never had any problems doing it that way, ever. But you can get them too tight. Get back on. Nothing's rubbing. Feels good. It's not loose. Brake pads. So because this brake rotor is quite a bit thicker than the one I pulled off here, I'm having to push back this uh, piston on this caliper quite a bit. These are the Doyle brand channel locks from Harbor Freight. I definitely, definitely like these. I got all the sizes that they offer on these. Picked them up some time ago. So if you didn't know, yeah, these may look a little dangerous, but I assure you, they're about as dangerous as ice cream cone. But this truck gets every bit as much attention or more attention, especially when Elizabeth's driving it, which you could argue there's reasons for that, uh, than the brown truck. It's just bigger, these wheels, you know, kind of kind of flashy, and, and uh, I get just endless thumbs up. Every time you take this thing out, people are, you know, and it's just old truck, you know, it just pulled out of the field not a few months ago. But you put a set of wheels on them, you clean them up, bring them back. You know, people don't see them that often. And it just makes people smile, including me. And that's why I love messing with these old things. So I want to give you a quick update on Johnny Cash, my wife's 1986 crew cab that we just got done, basically. Uh, not done, but close to done building. So we took this thing on its longest trip away from home last night, almost 200 miles, and this thing never missed a lick. And Elizabeth does drive this truck, even though it is large and a lot of people don't associate a petite lady driving something like this. You know, she doesn't drive it when she's going to the drive-thru at McDonald's, for obvious reasons, because it, it does not fit through a drive-thru. But if she's just going to town and wants to, you know, cruise, she'll drive it, and I'm proud of her. It is a very nice truck. So, what has changed? Windows are tinted, thanks to my brother Rick from Summers Auto Trim. If you live in Kentucky or maybe a surrounding state or something, you need window tinting, a headliner done, you need carpet put in your vehicle, you need a convertible top put on your Mustang, or a custom boat cover for your bass boat, I'm not for sure. Any of that stuff, he is really, really good at, and uh, he's a professional, that's all I can say. So he tinted the windows, this is 20%, which is legal. Uh, here in the, as dark as it can be, but legal here in the state of Kentucky. And uh, to be honest, I wouldn't want it any darker because when at nighttime, 
you know, even this is kind of hard to see out of. But it does a great job of keeping the heat down and the sun glare uh, during you know during the sunny days so let me show you this tonneau cover super quick my buddy ron white sent this to elizabeth and i was skeptical at first i'd never owned one because i never felt the need to have one but now that this one's on this truck my tune has changed they are absolutely awesome and i'll show it to you super quick then i'll show you the interior of this truck my brother's been working hard helping me to get this thing a little closer to finished so this is a tonneau pro it's a vinyl cover with an aluminum frame it's considered a trifold and i'm sure a lot of you guys have had them and, and know but for the guys who doesn't and who are skeptical it's the only reason i'm showing this i think for one it looks really good on this it's got a couple clips in the back it keeps everything that you put in the bed at least in this truck it keeps it bone dry and it's got an aluminum frame so it just folds into three sections if you want to haul something large folds into three sections and clips up here at the front and obviously you can take it out really easy it's just got two clips up front and you can pull the whole thing out you know so definitely like this thing you know i uh like i said i was skeptical at first but after uh after using this elizabeth you know can go to town put her groceries in the back ain't got to worry about them getting rained on or somebody just snatching stuff out of the back of the bed of the truck pretty nice i like that I like it a lot, actually. Got my lights in the tailgate as well. So let me give you a quick look inside of the truck. All of the doors are the same, so I'm just going to show you the driver's door. All of this is exactly what come off of it originally, except for my brother made these inserts, and you can buy these bot door bottoms. So these are new, and these are handmade by my brother. The rest of this stuff is just dyed factory stuff. So that looks really good, and that's as good as it's going to look because I'm not taking it any farther than, than what you see here because we, we plan to really use this thing. But that looks good. Let me get you a, a shot on the inside. So obviously the seat bottom is not done yet, but the seat backs, both for the front seat and the back seat, are completely done. I've got one that I can get you a better angle at inside, the one that goes in the back. My brother handmade these, and I just I want to show you because I think he done such a fantastic job on it. New carpet, got all the seals and stuff on. This truck is basically 100% together. I'm just waiting on a little bit of fabric so my brother can finish the seat bottoms. So let me take you inside in the shop and show you uh, show you the kind of work that he does so there's a look at the back seat backrest now all four seats are going to be the same check out how nice that looks me and elizabeth wanted something a little bit unique something that you just couldn't go and, and buy and my brother handmade these every stitch you know he did he ran through the sewing machine himself he'd done a fantastic job and i want to say a big thanks to to him and that's summer's auto trim in lawrenceburg so we went brick is what the color of the vinyl is on top originally this was cloth across the top and down the center but we wanted a little something a little unique so we went with we went with brick this is what elizabeth chose it just looks amazing in my opinion and then that is the original color as far as the cloth on the cushions so looks excellent let me show you the back you know they're just solid vinyl they just fit so good he's done a fantastic job so big thanks big thanks to my brother rick well i'll have to say that i am very happy with the parts that i got made today happy with the uh, maintenance that I got done on my air compressor, the maintenance got, that I got done on Elizabeth's truck, and I'm super happy with the dumpster find. I was shocked that it actually worked. I don't know how well it works, but it does turn on and move. So, you know, it's better than not turning on and moving, I guess. So that is it. Thanks for watching. Viewers, patrons, subscribers, anyone who's helped me out whatsoever is much appreciated. And that is it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.